when Kenny when Kenny shows up, they'll start the barking again. But okay, so we're recording now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good to see the faithful few this morning. Different people doing different things. So our usual crowd is is a little bit less, but we're glad you're joining us online, wherever you might be. Um, do we need to t turn the camera this it way? It should a be bit? angled at you right now. It's kind of pointing over here, which is fine. It's okay. So you want to take a look at it and see what you think? It's got down on the right side. Yeah. The right side. We're going to catch the board. I want to catch the board. Right. It's got the board too. It's just not quite like focused. Yeah. There you go. That's a little bit better. And that might help with the sound with the uh, mic. The mic is turned on, right? There's audio. <coughs> Excellent. Yeah, I already tested that out. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start with prayer. Why don't you just bow your heads. Father, we want to thank you so much for life again this morning. You bless us uh, in so many wonderful ways uh, we can't even imagine. You uh, take such good care of us. We pray and ask that you would be with us this morning as we have our, our Bible study time. That you'll draw near through your spirit, guide and direct in our conversation and in our study. And that the information presented will be a blessing to all who view it and receive it. We know, Lord, the time is short, and so we pray that you will help us in doing our part in lifting you up for all the world to behold. Let us uh, know more about you. Let us uh, um, share that great love that you have for humanity with others and the wonderful plan that you implemented to save us. So God, and direct us to that end. Bless all those uh, who are worshiping you today, and may we all receive the blessing you have stored up for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. We also want to remember, Lord, uh, uh, those who are <clears throat> dealing with different health issues, uh, a certain friend who just had a kidney transplant, we want to remember her, we want to remember Kenny's wife, that you draw near to them, and others as well who might be doing this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 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 What are you singing? It's in Scott's son. In Scott's son, yeah. Okay, so we, we do remember those folks Titus. during the week as well. Titus, um, lots of folks with health challenges. So, God is the healer, though, isn't he? I don't see anybody out there. <laughs> Unless Kenny pulled up while I wasn't looking, I don't see anything. Okay. Go lay down. Got our little door alarm there. Is the wagging her tail. I think I heard it. Maybe it's Jeremy coming over. That's Kenny. Oh, is he? Yeah, he pulled into a spot. Oh, okay. That's why I didn't see him. Stay over there. Stop. There he is. Morning, Ken. Shh. Isabel. No. No barks. Well done. I thought I was going to get here at a decent time, but I'm glad to work my way up to about three, four hundred bikes. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yeah. then I was behind cars, and they wouldn't pass them. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Several people had that complaint this morning. Floyd's full of them, too. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I don't know how many bicycles out there every day are they said, one bunch of them. They said as many as 2,500. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Talk so this morning, what's the bicycle thing? Uh, okay. uh, what's this bicycle thing? There's a bicycle rally or something going on in the area, and so... Uh, the annual Mountains of Misery or something like that. Mountains of Misery, yeah. Anyway, whether well, they're out riding bikes, we're here studying God's Word. I don't know. It just seems... Yeah. All I've done was grip my t yeah. teeth That's because right. some of them could go on, you know. But they run right along just because it's a double line. They wouldn't touch it, boy. They'd stay right behind the bicycle, uphill, downhill. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, on these backcountry roads, too, it gets a little more challenging because uh, they're not, you don't have the clearance a lot of times. But anyway, we're glad you made it. We, we, we just had prayer, so we're, we're just getting started. So you're not really late. Yeah. Okay. All right, and uh, we want to welcome all those who are joining us online as well. Um, this was going to be the earliest time I ever got here. <laughs> bicycles. bicycles took care of that. Huh? Okay. 
All right, well, this is the time that we talk about blessings that have gone on throughout the week. And uh, so be thinking about that and also some news items that may have caught your attention. Uh, of course, we typically have uh, still the, the political stuff going on. That's just a given in the... the there are parts of Texas climate. that were inundated with flooding this week. The coastal areas, some as many as 20 inches of rain. Yeah, well... And so they said it was worse than Hurricane Harvey. Oh, wow. Prob yeah, probably. Well, one reason that makes it worse is because they probably didn't expect it to be worse. So. No, that's a lot of rain to try to oh, deal with. Yeah, I mean, always. So. It just seems like every time I turn around, there's some place, Mexico, they had a city that got this huge flood. I mean, you're watching cars washing down the roads and dumpsters and everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, they are. This flood never where it rains, you know. Seems it's like it. Seems like it doesn't just rain; it, it pours now. And I feel for those people, you know, on the border down there that piling in here, and you don't know what to do with that many people. Well, you know that that's a real issue, and I, I hear uh, um, it's almost as if. This is the uh, expectation that all these people are going to come, and the and the question that people are focusing on is, you know, what do we do with them, and how do we how do we do with them, and etc. Well, the real issue is they shouldn't be coming to begin with. Well, you know, they yes, they shouldn't be coming. Open the, Obama the, opened the door for them. Well, the vast majority of them uh, are coming not together as families. Okay, there are some families that are coming. And, of course, everybody wants to focus on, you know, the kids being separated from the parents. And, uh, and nobody really is in favor of that. But, again, they're breaking the law by, by coming. And so they're, they're going to be treated accordingly. But the vast majority of them are, are just kids by themselves or, or individuals by themselves. None of them should be here. Well, I know. None of them should be here. They should be coming across a, a crossing point, not everywhere in between. This is uh, an interesting tidbit from the news. One of the men that's running to be the president of Mexico, oh, yeah. in his speech that. this week, he called for mass immigration to the United States, declaring it a human right for all North Americans. Americans. And soon, very soon, after the victory of our movement, we will defend all the migrants in the American continent and all the migrants in the world adding that immigrants must leave their towns and find a life in the United States. Now, now notice... Ever, ever, now, this is even going to plumb down into El Salvador. No? Yeah. Now you notice he's not saying, come to Mexico and we'll gladly receive you. We're op our borders are open. We want any everybody to come. Now we even speak he's the not language. Saying that. <laughs> it's open to go through. He's not saying that. He's saying, go to the United States so that you can send your money back here you know it's their it's their second source of revenue second largest source of revenue is the United States and so yeah they want everybody to come up here but, 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 uh, like Bernie Sanders. but uh, Mexico's in fact Mexico has much stronger border security than the United States does and so yeah we can go we could cross the border and decide we're gonna go live in Mexico and claim our rights to be there I think we have to turn it around hey everybody Come to Mexico and just feel welcome and just cross the borders and live in Mexico. Nobody wants like. to go to Mexico because of all the, the gangs and the well, drug traffic. Well, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a, a worse place, come to Mexico. I invite everybody to come to Mexico. Yeah, the weather's much milder down there. Up here in the United States, it's cold, it's rainy, flooding in Texas. I mean, come on, you don't want that. Stay in Mexico. That's the place to go. Yeah, in fact, maybe, maybe the United States ought to give you a gift certificate if you go to Mexico. Maybe we can give you like a hundred dollar gift certificate, you know, or something like that. Come to Mexico and we'll pay you to stay there. <laughs> That's what we ought to do. It would be better to do that than to uh, than to deal with all the stuff that we're dealing with now. I mean, one, we'll of the, one of the things on Facebook says if you have no border, you have no country. Yeah, we're the United States. We will figure it out and we'll deal with it and we'll get it done. And, uh, and and so be assured of that. But uh, a lot of people aren't going to like it, and that's okay because they shouldn't be here to begin with. Um, let's help them wherever they are. Let's try to yeah, do that. That'd be the uh, easiest yeah. 
thing for them. Yeah, let's try to help you wherever you are. I ain't got a thing again them people, but they still need to oh, come yeah. in. God's uh, children, come in the like legal the way. law says. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and that's something else I wanted to talk about for a few minutes here. Um, you know, we're dealing in the book of Revelation, chapters 13, 14, 12, 13, 14, and whatnot. And it provides a lot of historical application to, you know, paganism that become that became uh, uh, controlled by the papacy. So you had a, a religious organization controlling a civil organization. Um, and obviously the Bible identifies the players at the end of time particularly, as, as it's done throughout history. We can look back in history. Who, who was the, the primary... Um, who was the primary organization during the Dark Ages, causing problems during what we call the Dark Ages, that, that period of time, 1260 years from 538 to 1798? Who was the prime player there causing all the problems? The Roman Catholics would say the Protestants. Yeah, well, the Catholics might say it was the uh, people that were protesting, which became the Protestants. But truly, who was, who was doing the Crusades? Who, who was, who was uh, contacting the, the King of France and the King of England and the King of Germany and utilizing well, the them? The Roman Catholic as, power was controlling Okay, it so it was the Roman Catholic Church. church. Okay, and, and when I say the Church, I'm talking about the leadership of the Church, which is the pap papal power or the Jesuit order. They were conducting Crusades and if you want to just look at history, the greatest terrorist organization in history, and, and of course terrorism is defined as, as an organization that creates anarchy and causes a lot of pain and suffering and death. Okay? The greatest terrorist organization in history is the papacy, the, the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if you're Roman Catholic, or if you have relatives that are Catholic, you might gasp at that and say, how can you make such a claim? You know, this is a religion. This is a spiritual organization. Well, it's a spiritual organization that basically said, if you don't do what we think you should do, we're going to come and eliminate you. And that's what the Crusades were all about. They would come over and they would just eliminate people. And by their own estimates, over 50 million people were martyred. 50 million, that's their own estimate. It's probably closer to 100 million because you have 1260 years. Now look, don't we, doesn't, doesn't God love the Catholic people? Everybody. He loves the Catholic people. He loves Buddhists, he loves Muslims, he loves Catholics, he loves Protestants. God loves humanity. God put a plan together to save humanity. Okay? Now, sure, there are a lot of people around with different viewpoints different perspectives, they've been raised a certain way, right? They've been, they've been conditioned to accept certain things, right? That they usually are, uh, are detrimental. They accept it before they reach manhood, you know. Or detrimental. Um, the Bible isn't, you know, some people might consider this book to be a book that's hateful because it has a standard that it puts up here. And God says, follow this standard, follow this counsel, follow this instruction. Right? But there are a lot of people around that have no regard for this book. Oh, yeah. Right? They have no regard for it at all. They could care less what this book says. Okay? Now, if I believe what the book says, and if I promote what the book says, how are others going to feel about me? Are they going to say, well, you're a hateful person too because you say that if you don't follow the instruction in this book, this is going to happen and that's going to happen and you're going to be left out of the kingdom of God. That, that could, be, could be considered hate speech. But is that really hate speech? Well, Actually, it's love speech. They're going right? to call it that to the people who don't want to listen. They're going to call it. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate, just like, if I'm a Christian, I'm a true Christian, I don't hate anybody. Right? 
I, if you're well, gay, if you're a liberal, if you're whatever you, whatever you decide to be or call yourself, I don't hate you, you know. But but as a person who loves you, I'm going to tell you that this is the answer to all of your problems, to all of your questions. This is the an this is the path you must take if you want eternal life. Right? This is the path you take if you want to be saved and, and live eternally. That that's the, that's what God offers, right? And he says you must follow this path. Not any path that you choose, not any perspective that you want, right? So uh, even though, like you're saying, Ken, when when I hold this standard up and say God has a law to follow, uh, and you say I don't care, I'm not interested in, in God's law, uh, and, and so you know you are condemning me, right? You're condemning me. Uh, no, is it, is it is it is it am I the one that's condemning them? Not me. No. What's who's condemning them? God's doing it because this is His word. And if it wasn't His word, it wouldn't be in here. So, so, so God is the one that brings condemnation. Why? So He and why? So what's His motive? To torture people? To get people? To to, to, to cause people to, to be lost? That's not His motive. He he He's a God that's the saying, I'm I'm pushing you. I'm prodding you. I'm trying to inspire you to do what's right. To change to change your thinking. To change your perspective. Right here it is in black and white. You can read it if you choose, you know. And I have people around that are promoting what uh, what the book says, but they're doing it to try to move you from where you are in a lost condition to move you on a track that's taking you to the kingdom of God. Right? And and yeah, some people may be bucking and kicking along the way, right? But, but hopefully some of them are still going to get there. But there are other people who are going to do what? They are going to reject this. In fact, what does the book tell us? It tells us the vast majority of people are going to reject the plan of salvation that God has put in place. Right? Now, we have self that's our worst enemy to, that's warring against us. Right? Self is our worst enemy. But we also have outside influences that are, are also inspiring us to go in the wrong direction. And who might they be? Who's the number one culprit? Satan, Satan himself. Well, he is, so, so we have a supernatural foe trying to move us in the wrong direction, inspire us to go in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, but apart from that, we have who else? Well, you've got uh, Satan's got a bunch of demons or angels to help him. He's got a that bunch of help. never mentions. Right. He's got a, he's got a whole vast army of supernatural beings to help him. Who else? Self. <laughs> he's got all the people that follow his deceptions and delusions. Right, which is most of the world, and that, that involves organizations, and involves individuals, and involves royalty, and countries, and kingdoms. Okay, so in, in, in philosophy, and ideology, evolution. I mean, he's got the whole world basically in his hand. In fact, isn't that what we read last week in Revelation 13? All the world will what? Wonder after the beast. <laughs> right. Will end up paying homage and not only wondering after the beast, going his way, but actually worshiping him. Okay? Actually, we're actually, that's what the book says. Right? Well, they the book actually do that. They worship the Pope now. Okay. But, but what I'm saying is, we, we don't hate anybody. Right? But if you follow the truth, your very existence. Is a condemnation to those who don't want to follow the, who want nothing to do with the truth. Okay? And so those who follow the truth are going to be considered haters of humanity and haters of their their country 
and uh, haters of all that's good and productive and so forth. And, and we'll be despised, maligned, persecuted, tortured, killed. Okay? That's what the book says. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what the book is saying. So, in knowing all of that, is it worth it? You need to know that in order to, to have a defense against it. Well, of course it's worth defense. it because what's the end story? What's the end of the book say? Those who follow the truth, those who walk the narrow path, right, <laughs> will receive the kingdom of God. You know? Those, uh... Will be the bride of Christ. Will be a, 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 uh, a citizen of the New Jerusalem. Right? We, we know the end of the those story. Are, those that are holy, let them be holy still. So, and yeah. then you got the ones that are evil, they'll so, be evil still. So it's plenty worth, and the reason why it's plenty worth following the truth is because of what it will accomplish, particularly at the end. What, why has God called a group of people to be holy, to be righteous, right? Particularly at the end. What, what is really at stake? This whole uh, It's his country. reputation. It's, it's the reputation of, of our Father his in character. heaven. It, it's his character. It's a vindication of his character. Now, obviously, Satan, who has long been warring against the character of God, of course, the character of God is a reflection of his very law. It's the very foundation of his character. Satan has been warring against that from the very beginning, right? I have to uh, have this open. Let me just share. I think we may have read one of these. Uh, it's just from the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven. And nobody, how, knows, nobody knows exactly how long God prevailed with Lucifer then in trying to win him back, woo him back to the right side. We don't know how, exactly how long that happened. That could have been a thousand of our years. Yeah. Well, who knows? But from the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it's been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. He basically stood up one day and decided, uh, I have a better way. Is there a better way than God's way? There is no better way. Look at all humanity. They've been trying it for 6,000 years. There is no better way, right? All right, so he, that was his very purpose to begin with. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And again, he was so convinced that there was a better way, he was going to push it all the way to even create warfare in, in a perfect environment. Right? And of course, God could not tolerate that. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle, the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God, the character of God. He so, wanted to get his self a throne above God before, before he was ever cast out. That's the mystery of iniquity. How could anybody in heaven even imagine something better? Than what they're living what in, they had, yeah. than what they had. That to me, that's it's totally preposterous. That's why it's a mystery. It's totally preposterous, right? So, our little group here, we want to lift up Scripture. We want to promote the truth, right? And if that if that rubs you the wrong way, your issue isn't with us. It's with him. It's with God. Here's where your issue is with. Your issue is not with us. Because we have the issue with God. God there is uh, better than anything you can think of. <laughs> but at the same time, let me say that those who are convicted, those who have a conviction of truth, that, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, there's a difference between being convicted, right? A conviction of truth and uh, having a preference of truth. There are a lot of people around, if you ask them, if you took a poll and said, hey, would you like to follow the teachings of the Bible? Would you like to follow the truth? A lot of people might, even some may reluctantly say, well, yeah, sure we want to follow the truth. That's the right thing to do. But yet, if they go into the book and they start finding out what that is, 
they're going to resist that because maybe their lifestyle, you know, maybe their upbringing. Maybe their 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 job status, you know, maybe maybe all kinds of things. Everybody's are going worried to about the cost, what it's going to cost them, but they don't man, what it's going to cost them not to. That's it. I mean, if, you, if you're gonna, if you're worried about protecting whatever you've got in this three score and ten, that's going to all burn up, and in light of what you're going to lose out on in all eternity oh, with everything. Right. There's no comparison. There isn't. But you know, you look at the different religions around the world, all the different pagan religions, they have almost no restrictions. I mean, they'll take you under any stripe, any condition, right. you know, you, and even in Catholicism, you know, if you've committed a sin, you say three Hail Marys, two Our Fathers, oh, yeah. light a candle, and it's all done, it's you done. know, put a little money in the offering plate. Play, I good. mean, it's, it's so easy to follow all of these other spiritual um, directions. Yeah. There's no cost to any of them. And because really. they've bought they bought into the lie, and it's a definite lie that all roads lead to the kingdom. And you've heard that before, right? I've heard all that. roads lead to the kingdom. You know, so whether you're Buddhist, Muslim, you know, Krishna, Jehovah's Witness, you know, whatever you might be, Catholic, Protestant, who knows, who cares? You know, as long as you think that, that you're going to the kingdom, that's where you're going to go. As long as you're going toward the light. As long as you're going toward the light. <laughs> no, I don't say it's, it's what you think. It's what you think. And that's like Cain. That's the, that's the Cain, Canaanite attitude. I'll bring what I want, you know, because uh, you know, God's just going to have to accept it. You know, that's the whole thing. And not, not what He requires. But I just wanted us to realize that there, there's going to be a lot of resistance and a lot of hatred against those who promote the truth. But it's not, the issue is really not with us. Right? It's not us that they really have a problem with. I mean, we're the ones that they can get hold of. We're the ones that they can actually affect. They can't affect God. But that's the one that they really have the issue with. The, the issue with Him. Okay? And I, because we love, we love all people. Okay. No matter what they think, no matter where they've gone, no matter what road they're on, just like God loves all people and has provided a plan for their salvation, they're all but His. They're, they're, they're cre His creation, right? But whether or not you're a disobedient child or an obedient child, He loves you the same. Uh, unfortunately, the disobedient children are sealing their own fate. And what does Scripture say is their fate? Can't Destruction. Like fire. They're going to be destroyed, okay? They're going to be destroyed. All who love a lie. Because they've, they've decided to take that road. Okay? We want to encourage everybody, stop. Stop and think. Stop and take a look. You, you owe it to yourself to take a look at what the book says. Okay? You really do. I mean, you could be the furthest from you know, spiritual thinking. I mean, you might not even know where the book of Genesis is okay, in the Bible. But you owe it to yourself to take a look. You really do. And I don't care how you've been raised. I don't care what you've been taught. You owe it to yourself to take a look at the plan of salvation that God offers. Okay? It's, it's, it is the only way. It is the only way to experience what God wants. He wishes. He wants. He desperately pleads for all humanity to, to, to take that step. Um, and, and and we just pray for any any who, who will do that. All right. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to share? I mean, that's what I was on well, my heart uh, to share. I just wanted people to recognize, you know, we don't hate anybody just because they're from another country, another religion, another culture, another color. It doesn't make any difference. They're they got the same blood running through their veins. You know, they breathe we, the same do, air. But we do have an obligation to hate sin. But we do have an obligation to spread the word. To hate sin, yeah. And uh, yeah. to call it out, right? To say that the book says this is wrong. Okay, but in a loving way, right? We can't try to force someone to do what's right. We can only pray and let God work. Uh, in that regard. That's our powerful tool. All right, any other thoughts? Okay. All right. Um, again, I wanted to get really that aspect out.
because of where we are in our study in the book of Revelation. Revelation, remember we talked about the three main players at the end? Who are the, main, the three main players at the end according to the Revelation 13? Who are the three main players in Revelation 13? Well, the angels is going to be the trumpet, but and actually Jesus and, uh, and Satan is going to have a lot to do with these last Okay. Beast, days. the dragon of the land? Yeah, the, the beast power. The beast okay. power and the, uh, the governments. The beast power. Okay. So you, you've got... In other words, Satan has to unify. If all the world is going to wander after the beast, if all the world is going to worship the dragon, the dragon, okay, make you've got to have a one cohesive system in place. Okay. Now, Revelation 12 and 13 talk about the seven-headed, uh, uh, ten-horned beast. Right. It's 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 existed since antiquity of old. Right. It's the antichrist, uh, anti-God power that's always existed, all right. But but what Satan has done, he, of course, Satan is behind it, right? He's he's the one that's been promoting it. He's the one that's been inspiring it. He's the one that gives it its power, its seat, its great authority, etc. He's the one that's going to shine at right near the end. Okay. So when we look back in history, and we find that the dragon gave the beast its power, seat, and great authority, right? What were we specifically talking about in history and in antiquity? Okay, we're talking about paganism, right? Uh, which Satan, of course, inspires and controls and promotes, right? Because that's the antithesis of holiness and righteousness and godliness, right? It's the total opposite of that because it's humanism. It's, hu it's humanism with, uh, with uh, uh, added aspects and features included. So you've got Satan promoting paganism throughout history. That's kind of the beast system, right? And what Satan needed to do, and what he's always needed to do, is, is if you're going to try to get a person to drink poison, right? If you drink poison, if you put a couple drops of uh, arsenic in here, right? That would be it. And you swirl it around, you wouldn't even be able to see it, right? I mean, it would look just like this, right? You, would, you couldn't tell that the poison was in there. You right? take the poison. Right, you just drink it right on down, okay? So Satan can't make his deception and delusions totally obvious, or people would reject it. I'm not drinking that poison. I'm not. I'm gonna, not going to do that. That's going to kill me. But if he, but if he does it covertly, if he does it secretly, so that you don't even know it's in there and you can't see it, you can't tell without doing a chemical analysis on the water, right? Uh, you drink it right down, and maybe it's just enough poison to systematically make you sick. Sick, and then sicker, and then sicker, and then sicker. Till finally you get so sick, you can't even comprehend what the truth is, right? Your mind is so deranged. All right, so over time, he's done that to society, to culture, to humanity. You know, most people in humanity are so screwed up in their thinking and in their head, even when the truth comes their way, it's very difficult for them to even grasp it, to even think it's important. Okay? Am I telling the truth? Oh yeah. I'm telling the truth, right? All right. So you've got you got Satan working as a uh, uh, through paganism. That sets up in antiquity a spiritual organization, a religious organization, because that that's a positive. Right? That's a positive thing. And so for, for Satan to work through religion or a spiritual organization, man, what, a, what an incredible scheme. Because that's supposed to be leading you to God. That's supposed to be leading you down the straight and narrow path. That's supposed to be taking you to the kingdom. 
right? And so, in fact, not only set up one religious organization, but let's set up multiple religious organizations. How many religious organizations are, are, are in the world today? About 1,200, I think. 30 plus thousand. Thir over 30,000 religious organizations in the world today. Okay. Now, there are, there are some main ones. There are probably a hundred main, there are probably a hundred that we could name here, right? Uh, you know, you got Buddhism, you got Shintoism, you know, you got all the isms, right? And then you've got myriads of denominations around, right? We could probably name a hundred right here, right off the top. Pretty of funny how all the, all the isms are not them, <laughs> you know. All right, so, so, so you have so many counterfeit religious organizations out there. I mean, it's worse than a smorgasbord, you know. Uh, but people truly gravitate toward what they were raised with, what their culture uh, mandates, uh, you know, how, or how they feel, you know, what makes them feel okay. That's what they, you know, that's, that's what's, what they grasp, what they grasp. But, but in antiquity, Satan raises up a religious organization that not only says, here, we have something for you, we have some food for you to, to, to consider. You might like this food, this diet, try this. Well, no, this organization doesn't say, hey, try this, we think it's okay. What do they say? They say, you're going to eat this food. Right? This is the diet you're going to have. And if you don't eat this food, this doctrine, if you don't embrace this doctrine, guess what? We're going to eliminate you. We're going to eliminate you, right? But a religious organization, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to get their hands stained with blood, right? So what they do is they decide to get the secular governments to enforce their doctrine or their dogma or, or their instruction, right? And that's what happened in antiquity. That's what happened in the Dark Ages. The religious organization that was raised up was Papal Rome. The Bishop of Rome was exalted and it became it became Papal Rome. But they sent the Roman and, army and, after and the Jesuits. The yeah, and the Jesuits of course were behind the scenes doing everything, controlling it. And they found out that they could use the secular government to put the teeth into forcing their perspective of this book even. Okay? And that's that's what that's how we end up with the dark ages. That's what we looked at last week in chapter 17. That was the woman. A woman is a church in, in Bible prophecy. That was the woman riding the beast. Okay. Now a lot of people today, now I want you to understand, history is going to be repeated. Right? History is going to be repeated. But at this, at this at, when we get to this ultimate repeat, we're down near the end of time, aren't we? We're near the end of the of probationary time. So Satan can't be content with having like the Roman Empire as his tool. Because the Roman Empire only in, only uh, really encompassed twenty five percent of the world population back in the first century. Twenty five percent, one quarter of the world's population lived under Roman rule back during the time of Christ. Satan can't be content with that. He can't leave any sovereign nation out there on its own to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to follow that. So he has to bring everybody under his umbrella. There has to be a world system. That's why in, in chapter 13 of Revelation, you have a beast coming up out of the sea, but it's a beast that's a composite. Now let me, let me read. I thought this was pretty good out of uh, unfolding the Revelation. Uh, it says here, uh, uh, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, right? It says, uh, some because of the uh, similarity of language in John's and Daniel's description. Remember Daniel, he saw beasts rising up as well, but he saw individual, he saw an individual lion raise up that had wings. He saw a bear raised up, you know, one side higher than the other. He saw, you know, a leopard with eagle's wings. He saw a dreadful beast. He saw a distinct beast coming up. But, but John 
sees a composite beast coming up. He sees a single beast coming up that looks that has the characteristics of a lion. It has characteristics like a bear. It has characteristics like a leopard, etc. Right? It says, uh, first there was the lion kingdom and the bear kingdom and then the leopard, the Greek kingdom, then the ten-horned beast, Rome. All these characteristics are embodied in the beast of Revelation 13. So you've got all the cultures, you know, all, all the DNA, if you will, of culture throughout history all combined in this beast system at the end. It is therefore a composite symbol of the kingdoms of this world over which Satan has exercised dominion. That's right out of uh, this book here. All right. So you've got this composite beast, and it's it's this composite beast that is a world system now. It's a world system that we're dealing with, not sovereign nations over here and over here and over here. That would be too difficult for Satan to control. Remember, he has to control all of humanity. Okay. Last week we talked about. In chapter 12, you have the seven-headed beast, and the crowns are on the heads, right? Indicating seven sovereign type nations, right? And through antiquity, we could name them, right? You know, Babylon, Greece, Persia, you know, Egypt, we could name those kingdoms, right? That Satan was using. But at the end, in the, Revel the beast of Revelation 13, the crowns are not on the heads, on the horn. they're on the horns. So now you have ten crowns on the ten horns. Okay? That, that multiplies remember we, all the... Right. Remember what we talked about? We talked about last time, we talked about here you got one beast, and now it has ten crowns on the horns. Right? And we talked about how the Club of Rome back in the 60s divided the world into what? Ten zones or ten regions. Okay? North America is number one. Okay? In fact, you know, there's going to be a new election slogan coming out, I, I predict. America is rising. America is rising. That's going to be a, a new election slogan. You're going to see that at some point in the future. America is rising. You know, something like that. All right? uh, we've become great again. Now we're rising even further. All right? To become even greater. All right? And that's the, that's the second beast of Revelation 13. In fact, what does it say? Another beast rose up, right? Looking like a two horns like a Christian nation, but it will speak like a dragon. Okay? In antiquity, the same thing is happening that happened in antiquity. Right? The same thing is being repeated that happened in history. The religious, the apostate woman, is going to use a secular power to enforce her dogma, her doctrine, her instruction. Okay? Who is that secular force at the end that's going to enforce, again, the papacies or the Jesuit, the Jesuit mandate? Who's going to enforce that? The, the United States of America. Now, I love our country. I love our country, right? But we are the strongest nation in the world. We're, we're down near the end of time. Right? The world, the world system has come together, in case people aren't aware, the world system has come together economically. We're tied together economically. Okay? All, here, here, are the, here are the seven heads. The seven heads now are not sovereign nations, they're not wearing crowns, right? but the world is divided into ten zones. And in order for Satan to control all humanity, you need to have a religious head, a political head, an economic head, etc. An agricultural, a healthcare head, a military head, an education head, an energy head. You got those heads, right? If they are all part of the world system, they will control humanity. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, so that's what that's what we talked about over the last two weeks. This be the beast system, right? The beast of Revelation 13 is not the papacy. Okay. People don't understand this. The beast system is the, is the one world system. The papacy is one of the heads of that system. Okay? That's exactly what it says. Just read what it says. This was one of the heads that was wounded to death, and the mortal wound was healed. Okay? And then you have the second beast. You have the, the, the civil power right? that's going to enforce the dogma. Okay? Same thing is happening 
a repeat of history, a repeat of the Dark Ages, but now it's global. It's not just located in, in, in Europe, etc. It's global. Okay? That's what John is, is advocating here in chapter 13. And it's important. Um, the beast system has, has a number, 666. If you, if, you, if you look at throughout history, there are several um, links to 666. I mean, it's talking about a whole pagan system of worship is what it's talking about. Now, yeah, I mean, there's several, there's several people that have that, you know, Ronald Wilson, Reagan, you know, Michel, Mikhail Gorbachev. I think there's several people throughout history, their names actually translate to that same number. Now, it's, it's not only on the Pope's mitre, but there are several people, all these people that we could identify uh, as, as, as men, as human beings that have the same, they're all part of the same pagan system of worship, right? So it's identifying a system. Um, so we can't specifically, we can't be running around calling the Catholic Church the beast of Revelation 13. That's uh, really not technically accurate, even though they're part of it. Even though the paper, and, and, and in fact, the Catholic Church, in fact, Ellen White makes an interesting statement. She says, well, there will come a point where we'll have less to say about the Roman Church, right? And, and I don't think it's so much the Roman Church as it is the leadership it's the papacy, it's the Jesuits, right? When you look at our Congress, when you look at our government, you look at the Supreme Court, you know, which is the judicial, you look at the, the Congress, which is the legislative, and you look at the, the presidency, right, which is the executive branch. When you look at those three branches of government, how many Jesuits do you have in those branches of government? It's, it's filled with Jesuits, right? whether they want to admit it or not. I mean, it's just full. It's controlled by Jesuits. So who really is controlling our government right now? The papacy. Right? The papacy. I mean, we are linked up, right? They, they have infiltrated our government to the point where they're really in control of it, okay? And I'm just, I'm just citing facts and figures, okay? Uh, so that, that's where we are. We're, we're coming down to this conclusion. The world's come together. It's under the control of Satan. And where does that leave us? You know, that leaves us with still a mission to accomplish. That leaves us with still an obligation as an ambassador of the kingdom to lift up the Savior. Doesn't it? Okay. We, we, uh, we, we don't fear. We don't fear Satan's scheme. Right? Psalm chapter 1, you know, God sits in the heavens and He laughs at the scheming of humanity. Right? Nobody can catch God by surprise. Right? Nobody's going to outmaneuver Him. Right? They're not going to outflank Him and outmaneuver Him and, and gain an advantage and, and do something that He doesn't know about, that He doesn't expect. Right? God's always He knows in, the beginning from the end. He knows the beginning from the end. Okay? So he, he kind of chuckles at, at, at the schemes. But, but listen, Satan is a foe worth consideration because he's not only supernatural, but his, his very existence is at stake. And that's what people don't understand. People don't understand, you know, the devil's just, you know... He's in a fight for his life. Yeah, he's in a fight for his life. We're, we're the pawns caught in the middle of a supernatural warfare. So, but people don't realize how extreme... The, the the battle is going to get at the very end. Okay? Well, what you got it's all, all already hooked the together. world. All it's the world is being arrayed against God's people, but God's people still have a mission, and that's where we come to chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. All you got to do is Satan make his appearance, and he'll bring it all together because of his uh, things he can do. Now it's no coincidence that. Chapter 14 starts out with uh, the first five verses. They're talking about the remnant. Okay, talking about the remnant of God. Um, these people were introduced. Remember back in chapter seven. So um, right here, see this? Chapter seven, 144,000. Chapter 14, 144,000. 
Chapter 21, 144,000 again. So there, they are the um, this this they are the one in the six to one ratio, right? And of course, the the seven is of course God's perfect number. Uh, things are going to play out over the course of seven thousand years. Uh, six thousand of those will be probationary time, and one thousand. And of course, God says He's going to cut it short, so it won't reach to the full six thousand because it. Be, He's got to cut it short to save uh, the remnant, particularly. And so it's no coincidence that they're being um, looked at here again. And what's the main thing that you find in the first five verses here? We'll, we'll go ahead and read, read these five verses, and you tell me what you think the main thing is here. It says, Then I looked and beheld, this is chapter 14 of Revelation, I'm reading from the New King James. Then I looked and beheld a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He went, wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Okay, what's the, what are the, maybe there's more than one main thing, but what are the things that, are, that really stand out in those five verses? How many are standing on Mount Zion with him? 144,000. Okay. It's not 100,000. It's not a million. It's 144,000. Um, we talked, when we, in chapter 7, we talked about the fact that, you know, some people debate whether this is a literal number or a symbolic number, right? And actually, what we discovered back then, some months ago, was that this is a number that, of course, ultimately uh, funnels down to nine. The number nine is, an, uh, is symbolic of eternity, right? So here you have a group of people that specifically are identified who are going to live through to the very end. They're never going to taste death. So in that sense, as soon as they were born, in that sense, as soon as they were born, they, they basically were going to live for eternity. That's, that, that, so their, numbers, their, their, their number would be reflected by the number nine, okay, number one. Uh, number so nine. it's a literal number and it's a symbolic number. Where'd you get the number nine? One plus four plus four plus zero plus zero plus zero equals nine. Okay. And, <clears throat> and we, we went through that a little bit months and months ago. All right. So, it says here that they learn a song that nobody else can learn. It's a song of Moses. It's a song of Moses and the song. It's identified in chapter 15 and chapter 16. It's and the song of Moses. And the whole thing good. When they didn't defile or set with uh, the woman, it means they was in the right church all the time. Okay, in other, right. So in other words, they they followed the truth. They oh, lived the truth. They followed the truth. They have their father's name. What's it mean to have their father's name written on their foreheads? You're thinking you're living like it? Okay, God has can God has total control of the will, which oh, is in this, which is in the frontal frontal lobe, right? The frontal lobe is where you're making decisions and choices. Right? So God has the decisions and choices that they make, they're, they are, they're not living by preference, they're living by conviction. Okay? Their characters are reflecting the very character of God. Uh, John says that in, in 1 John chapter, chapter 1, you know, or 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, yet it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He appears we shall be like Him. Yeah. We shall see him as he is. Okay, so, 
So they're, they're, they're reflecting the character of God. And it's the glory of God that destroys, when Jesus shows up, it's the glory of, of Him that actually destroys, that brightness destroys the wicked because they sin has darkened their lives and their character, so they're consumed by that brightness, whereas the righteous are reflecting that glory because they are following the righteousness of God. The wicked have no protection they from no his protection glory. They have no protection from his glory. So they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And in other words, the music is playing, but they sing the song, right? And, of course, no one knows that song. No one learned has, had learned that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So they learn the song down here, right? And, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, sung in heaven. And what is that? That song is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And we've talked about that for the last two years. All right? It's the song of the law and the blood. It's the song that understands what, what those the lyrics. The lyrics explain the marriage of Messiah's two offerings. That's the essence of the song of, of Moses and the Lamb. It's the song of his two offerings. The the blood. And it's it's the people down at the end that learn that song, and that song becomes so significant because it's what enables them to persevere the trials of the last days. Okay. Not defiled with women, they're they're living a pure faith. <clears throat> uh, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first roots to God. In their mouth is no deceit, and they are without fault before the throne. It's an important quality. In um, their mouth is no deceit. You know, we've got we've got a world that thrives on lies. Yeah. Everything that everything that's out there, if you see it on the the news media, you can be reasonably sure seventy five percent of it's a lie. Yeah, and it's so. <laughs> And yeah, you don't know what to believe anymore. Exactly. I mean, they, they've they lied to us about the politics. They've lied to us about the economy. They've lied to us about education. I mean, everything on the list, the media has lied to us about all of these things. Right. And the whole world is following these lies, thinking that they're truth. Yeah. Yeah. Humanity has definitely been conditioned to follow, be a follower and not a leader. You know, you, you got your 16 squares. And that's all you need. That's all you're going to get. That's all that exists. And so, so you know, that's what we have. Okay, so John is giving us uh, a picture as he begins this chapter of a group that will be victorious over the beast, right? And over the authorities, the civil power that will try to enforce the dogma of the beast and over the whole one world system, right? John's giving us a picture. They're, they, they're standing on, on uh, Mount Zion with the Lamb, right? They're victorious over the beast. And it, it, it's very few in regard to, to uh, the population of the world. Then John goes into he backs up a bit to show us what will take place just before probationary time closes. Just before, just like, can you imagine um, Noah? Imagine Noah, for example. God has given him the timing, right, of, of when the flood is going to occur. He's given him the, the, the year. Remember when he gave him the mandate, he said, I'm telling you, you know, my, my spirit should not always strive with men. The word is deem. It means to, to uh, investigate. My spirit will not always investigate and strive with men. For men, you know, days shall be 120. So he gives them the timing of when the flood is going to be. So Noah starts building the, starts the project, and he's building, building, building. And, of course, he, he's in, engaged in, in actually constructing the boat and making sure it has all the supplies necessary. But at the same time, he's, he's preaching. He's telling the people, you know, 
you're, you're living an unrighteous life, you know, you're, you know, you're going to be condemned, God is going to destroy this place. And what are the people saying in response? It's laugh. You're nuts. You know, the laws of nature are fixed. They're, every day is the same. You they know, the, rain, the world is pristine. You know, the, 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 there's never been a flood, etc. And so, you know, so he has that to contend with. But eventually, the year comes that Methuselah dies, and his name means the year I die, it will come. Noah also knows that it's the 120th year when he started the project. Right? So, how intense do you think his preaching is now compared to what it was before? How, how intense is his preaching? How, how, how uh, earnest is he now as compared to 10 years before or 100? He knows time is almost gone. It's almost over. Right? And so I, I can just imagine the intensity and severity of his, and the pleading of his, of, his, of his message. He believed God, uh, the Bible tells us. And, and so the same thing happens at the very end. But instead of having one guy, you've got 144,000 people that God has called. Remember, these are the called. These are the chosen. These are the faithful ones. In chapter 17, it talks about that. Now look how John pictures this. Look how he pictures this message going to the world. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. All right? So here, this is the first, what we would call the first angel's message. And it's going to what? It's going to the entire globe. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people, this message is going. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Okay? Time is running out. Probationary time is going to end. Just like Noah standing back there, look, the door is going to close. Uh, soon. You need to, to make a decision, a choice. You need to come and get on the boat. Right? The same thing is happening here. The hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who made the heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. Now, let me ask you a question. We, we looked at chapter 3 of Revelation a long, many months ago. What was Jesus? This was, this was Messiah's perspective of what his church was going to be at the end of time. Remember the church to the Laodicea? The last church, the church of Laodicea. Right? Are they accomplishing this mandate here? Are they taking the gospel message to the, all, the, all the world? Some are, I guess. Oh, you got... Uh... The three angel messages, you know, that uh, uh, the satellite, if you want to put it that way, that satellite is carrying it to the world now. What is Jesus' perspective of the church of Laodicea? What does he say about them? They are poor, wretched, blind, blind, wretched, miserable, and they've deceived naked, themselves. naked, right? They believe that they're doing a wonderful thing. They, they have a need of nothing, right? But what don't they realize? They need everything. They need everything. They're self-deceived. They've deceived themselves in thinking, because they're playing church, you know, they may be going to a building, they may be paying their tithe, they may be, you know, uh, off work on Sabbath, but is this mandate being accomplished? Is the gospel... In fact, it doesn't say the gospel. It says having the everlasting gospel message to preach. I think it's going on myself. In John, in John chapter... Not John. Um, Matthew 24. You have similar language in Matthew chapter 24. 
In Matthew chapter 24, uh, 14, it says, uh, well, I'll, I'll start at verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness or iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. That's exactly what John is saying. John is saying, but John is saying it's the everlasting gospel message. What makes it, when you put that word everlasting in there, what does, what does that indicate? Eternal. It indicates an eternal message, an eternal gospel message, and the only way you can have an eternal gospel message is if you understand and add the marriage of the law and the blood, the two offerings. You can only have an everlasting gospel message if you include the marriage of Christ, of both of his offerings. Okay? So the question remains, is the church is the corporation is the entity that calls itself the church today are they promoting the marriage of those two offerings i don't think so not no not really because like like all of christianity like like most all of christianity today they look at the obvious the exposed evidence and say jesus is hanging on the cross there his death is what accomplished the atonement not realizing that that's an impossibility a human death is not equal to that which was transgressed. It could never. There's no. There's no equity there. Okay. Which was also something that the Jews should have realized when they were going through the sanctuary service. The sanctuary was is every that the blood year. of bulls and goats didn't didn't accomplish anything. It was simply a symbol of what was going to happen. Exactly. It was all point. I mean, every the 1,500 years, 1,500 times they went through rehearsing this marriage that would take place in reality at Calvary. The church doesn't promote that. To, the church doesn't teach that today. No church does. Because they, they, they bought the Calvinistic view that the death of this human being, this perfect human being, accomplished the atonement. Nothing else is necessary. And, and if they really processed it and thought it through, they would re recognize the human, because Christ was subject in his human nature, subject to death, that disqualified him from covering the transgression of an eternal law. Just, just not, you have to have an eternal offering, something not subject to death. The church doesn't teach that. The church does not promote an everlasting gospel. A gospel, yes, but good news, yes, Jesus died. He, he took our place. Great news. But they don't include the everlasting concept. Okay? Now, uh, they don't it, it recognize that he covered the law. Exactly. With yes, not his was. human offering, but with his divine, divine offering. offering. Absolutely. That's the key. You see, that's the key. And, and they don't get that. They don't get that. Hopefully, many people will start to get that. Um, When is it that that this when is it that this process actually began to develop, and how did it develop? Do you know that this was actually prophesied? This was actually prophesied in the Bible that, that that this event would take place specifically. Let me take you back, Proverbs chapter nine. Go back to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. Just back there, past Ecclesiastes. Proverbs chapter 9. The wise man. The wise man actually prophesied this. Right? Proverbs chapter 9. Look at the first six verses here. I it's, wonder why I got it marked. Yeah, wonderful, Ken. It says, Wisdom has built her house. Uh, I think the regular King James says, uh, Wisdom had built her house. Who is the source of all true wisdom? God is. Okay, God is the source of all true wisdom, right? And so when you look at the rest of these pronouns, where it says she has hewn out her seven pillars, you could just 
you could put God's name in there. I mean, I know people get offended when I say put God's name in there because nobody really knows God's name. But for the sake of, of most Christians that recognize uh, who I'm talking about, uh, God has built His house. God has hewn out His seven pillars. He, God, have have slaughtered His meat. God hath mixed her wine, His wine. God hath also furnished His table. In other words, He's preparing a banquet, right? God's preparing a banquet here. Mm -hmm. He's God has sent out His maidens or His angels, and He cries from the highest place of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. Whoever wants understanding, come to where the seven pillars are. As for him who lacks understanding, God says to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink the wine that I have mixed. Forsake fool foolishness and live. Go in the way of understanding. This, 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 is, this is a prophecy of the everlasting gospel message going out to the entire world. Right? It's going out. To, this is the invitation to come to the banquet. Come to where the, the, the proper food, the proper drink, the proper doctrine can be understood. It's where the seven pillars are. Right? God's built, God's built His house. Now what are the seven pillars? <clears throat> what are the seven pillars? When you think that God has this dilemma at the end, He has this group of people, this corporation, they think they have everything they need. They think they have understanding. But God says, wait a minute. You're poor, wretched, blind, miserable, naked, and you don't even know it. Right? 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 So what God says is, God says, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Now, I believe what Kenny is saying. I, I believe what you said earlier, Ken. There are some involved. There are some part of that corporation that are doing all they can to promote the gospel they know. Okay? I believe it. I believe it. A lot of good people within the corporate church at the end doing what they know to do, believing what they know to believe, promoting and, and, and handing out literature and sharing Jesus Christ with their friends. I, I, I believe it. But God says at the end, he takes matters and he says, I can't rely on this corporation because they're poor, blind, wretched. I, I've assessed their, their spiritual condition and they don't even know they're in that condition. Right? And so he says, I'm going to provide the food and I'm going to provide the banquet and I'm going to send out the message using seven pillars. And here are the seven pillars. Right here, right behind me on the wall. God's show and tell. Noah's Ark. Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? The Great Pyramid on Giza, the Giza Plateau, and Saqqara further south. What happened at Saqqara? Anybody remember? Remember the story of Joseph? You know, the, the majority of the book of Genesis over 20% of the entire book of Genesis focuses on one story, the story of Joseph. Right? From, 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 chapter, from chapter like 32 on, the, the last 11 chapters of the book of Genesis focuses on the story of Joseph. And this highlights what happened at Saqqara where he prepared the seven years of of uh, plenty and the seven years of famine and how Egypt became the savior of the world at that moment in history. Right? So, so here you've got that particular story. You've got the Red Sea crossing site. You've got the Mount Sinai. Right? You've got Gethsemane and the garden tomb. You've, you've got the, the crucifixion site and the Ark of the Covenant. This is all God's show and tell that all these sites have been, been raised up over the last 30 plus years. And these are the stones that are crying out. Right? The story of, of watch this, the story of Noah's Ark is really a story about mercy. Sodom and Gomorrah is a story about judgment. The pyramid 
and, and uh, Sakar as a story about pres uh, preser yeah, preservation and perseverance. Right? Um, the, the Red Sea crossing site is a story about deliverance. Mount Sinai is a story about relationship. The Ark of the Covenant and the uh, crucifixion site is a story about sacrifice. Gethsemane in the Garden Tune is a story about victory. Right? Physical victory and spiritual victory over death. Well, wait a minute. I, I just, I've just given you the essence of the everlasting gospel message. Mercy, right? Mercy and judgment, perseverance, deliverance, relationship, sacrifice, and victory. That's the essence of the everlasting gospel. In the last 30 plus years, God has sent this all around the globe. This information is in every language all around the globe. Right? That process began, interestingly enough, I know Rose doesn't like to hear me say this, but interestingly enough, she was the one that God tapped into to put it up on the internet back in 1995. In 1995, that process began when Rose put that information up on the World Wide Web. All this insight went global. We, were get, we get messages from people, little islands in the sea. That, that say, hey, we came across your you know, message and, and, and we're just, we, we got a message this week from some guy that just found it and he was just blown away by what God has done. What God has done. Not, not the corporate church, not those that are poor, wretched, blind, miserable, and naked, but what, what He has done. He, he took one person, and the way we know that He did that is He took one person And showed him where all this was. And he went around and collected all this information, Ron Wyatt did, and compiled it together. And, and Rose finally got, got wind of it. I finally got wind of it. And it went out on the World Wide Web. So you can see how God takes one person here and uses them, another person here and uses them. And, and one person can do incredible things with God's blessing. This is God's show and tell. This is the everlasting gospel message going to the entire world. And you know what? You know what the great thing is? The great thing about this is that there's no prejudice against this. If a church, Just see how ingenious that was. If God took a corporate church that has certain doctrine and said, here, be responsible for taking this message around the world, what do you end up with? A lot of prejudice. Wasn't, Pe people won't even Jesus? look at it because it has a name on it. A title on it. Weren't the Jews kind of that very test? Well, the, well, the Jews ended up the same way. The, yeah. the reason why the, the church fathers in the first century got rid of everything Jewish is because they were biased. They were prejudiced against them. So you can see how that works. But God, and of course, God knowing human nature and knowing that that would be the case takes one person. One person could never find all of this. Never in a, in a million years. He doesn't even take a... I mean, God, God could have said... God could have inspired a university to come together. He, God could have inspired a whole team of scholars to come together. But, but what would they have done? They would have goofed it up. They would have said, wow, look what we did. <laughs> no! You didn't do anything. God did it. And God took one person on purpose and used him on purpose because he wanted to he wanted to make sure the miraculous supernatural god inspired stamp would be all over it right now some people deny this in fact the very church that's poor blind wretched and naked fights against this they fight against it god gave it to them and they fight against it. It's absolutely crazy. But nonetheless, God is going to make sure that this everlasting gospel message goes to the entire world. He's going to make sure of that because it's eternal destinies hang in the balance. Right? And so He has to make sure that the message, mercy, and judgment, 
and perseverance and deliverance and relationship and sacrifice and victory. He has to make sure that the everlasting, the essence of the everlasting gospel message goes around the globe. And so it's begun. Amen. And the reason I'm so passionate is because I know that it's begun. It began back in 1995. It's been going on for decades now. God is so merciful to give us the time. He put Trump, I firmly believe He brought Trump in power to, to take the foot off the acceleration of this development here. And that's all that's happened. The Bible is clear. We're going to still end up with this. But, but, but we were speeding, speeding toward this. Fast. And by putting Trump in place, He's taken his foot in the off. We're still, we're still, we're still coasting. We're still drifting, and coasting uh, the momentum. We're still moving toward this, but not as fast. Not now as fast. And it's going to be interesting because, see, we've got to have that second beast rising. And I believe we're going to see, especially with Trump's second term, and I believe he will get a second term. That's going to be. We're starting to see now the rising of America. Make America great again. The rising of America is happening right now in front of us. Who's talking about it? Who, who's saying Bible prophecy is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes? It's happening right now. Make America great again. America is on the rise. Yes, we are. Uh, the government has already been seated with all the Jesuit control. As soon as the time is just perfect, we're going to see all these things play out that we've talked about over the last several months. It's going to happen. Okay? Now that's just the first angel. That's just the first angel of gospel, right? We're almost out of time, but look at the second here. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Um, there's going to come a moment in time when truth is going to be exalted. Okay? In other words, the gospel message exposes truth to the entire world. But now it's going to be exalted, right? God is going to make a special point to exalt truth. And he does that by exposing the error. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Ba what does Babylon mean? Confusion, right? At the Tower of Babel, the languages were confounded. There, were, there was confusion. And when we look in the world today, all we see, 30,000 different religious organizations plus, we see lots of confusion in the world today. Oh boy. Right? Lots of confusion. Right? But there's going to be, by those, or the, I, I call them the untouchables, you won't be able to touch, Satan will not be able to touch the 144,000. And, and, and as they're in development, they're like Noah before the door closes, screaming to the mountaintops, right? That, that time is almost over and, and you need to come out of her, my people. You need to come out of confusion, right? And so truth is going to take a prominent stand here, right? Truth is going to take a prominent stand by exposing the deceptions that have been going on. And it's worldwide. All nations are drunk with the wine of, of that beast system that we talked about last, uh, of the, the apostate woman riding the beast. She's using the beast system as her foundation, and then she's using the civil authority and power of the United States to enforce her dogma, her false doctrine. That's going to be exposed. And then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And of course, that's going to occur when? When is that going to occur? Once probationary time closes, when the plagues are poured out. And that's why chapter 15 and 16 focus on the, the final plagues. Okay? 
So, so you've got, you see how, how this all progresses. I mean, it's just the whole, John is just giving us a systematic progression of how things are going to unfold at the very end. And unfortunately, we throw too many things back into history and, and look at the applications instead of the ultimate fulfillments. <clears throat> There's a warning. This is the last, this third angel's message is the last warning message to humanity. Right? And the issue, the issue that becomes highlighted, the issue that Satan tries to use, is something that everyone is exposed to. Okay? Just like in the garden. And this is the test. This is the test that comes to the, not only the church, but also the world. Back in the Garden of Eden, did God test the whole world? He did. It was just Adam and Eve, and He tested the whole world using the tree. Right? Mm -hmm. When, when he took Gideon's army down to the river, tested. was everybody tested there? All 10,000 people were tested with a river. Okay? At the end of time, God uses something to test the entire world. What does everybody have access to? Time. Time. Everybody has the same amount of time. Okay? So God uses time as the testing mechanism for the entire world at the end. And here it is. Here's the warning right here. Right? The beast, right, spurred on and inspired by one of its heads, the papacy, has established its own authority and its own day of worship. And what day is that? It's the day, because it's coming from paganism, and because it's coming from Baal worship, that philosophy, they established the Sunday as the day of worship. The worship of the sun, the S-U-N. Okay. And so they use that as their mark of authority over the entire world. All right? And of course, most of the world today, what day does most of the world keep today? Sunday. Friday. Friday? Most of the world today honors Friday as their day of worship. Okay. I, I Muslims. It's Sunday. Muslims. In this country, in the United States, it's Sunday. And in many other countries, it's Sunday. But in, in 1.6 billion people honor Friday. That's the predominant day for a single religious organization to, 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 to group. Now, so actually, um, you know what? You guys were actually correct. You, because Sunday is cumulative. Because the United States worships Sunday, the Catholics, they're, they're 1 1.3, 1.2 or 3 billion Catholics, so they worship Sunday, and then Protestants have come over to Sunday, and so, yeah, Sunday, is the, Sunday is the predominant day. Okay, but there are 1.6 billion Muslims who keep Friday. Well, what's going to happen with them? You see? What's going to happen with other people that worship other times, like Sabbath keepers who worship Sabbath? Right? Well, so on they're going to be told worship on Sabbath. The right right. Day. Yeah. So God uses time, right? And by the time we get to this place in prophecy, what's held up are just two options. Okay? And I've been I've been told that many Muslims are actually going to go over to Sunday as well. Okay? So, by, the, by this time, only two options are available. Saturday and Sunday. Sunday and the true day of worship that God established. And that's why, that's why in the first angel's message, it says to worship Him who made heaven and earth. You know, worship the Creator. Right? So, God uses time. He uses the time that he established as the day of worship to honor his creation and his recreation. And the choice is then made by all humanity. Do we comply with man-made tradition or do we honor the God, the Creator God of heaven and his creation? Okay. And so, what's the outcome? And of course, this is the final warning, right? This is the outcome. If you worship the man-made tradition, you're going to receive the full wrath of God, which is poured out 
full strength into the cup of his indignation, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire, and you're going to be destroyed. Now, wow, that sounds like hate speech, doesn't it? That sounds like I'm condemning most of the world, doesn't it? I think most of the world are going. At this point, though, in history, Ken, <clears throat> the world will know the issue. The world will know. We either follow the traditions of men, a man-made stipulation, or we follow the law of God. Remember, remember what we read earlier that Satan began when he, when he began his apostasy, apostasy in heaven. The issue was over the law of God, and at the end, it's over the law of God as well. And here we go. In the heart of the law of God is remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And there'll come a point in history where a person has a choice. Either we honor the God of heaven or we honor the traditions of men. One is going to lead to eternal life and secure eternal and one is going to lead to eternal death. And the full wrath of God poured out against them. That's the choice people are going to have to make. That's the test that's coming to the church and to the world. Okay? Now unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately. Most of the world has already been conditioned to accept the false, the, the, the worship of the Sunday, right? Instead of the Sabbath day, right? And many people will choose that day just because the vast majority of humanity, and because of the benefits that come from it, they'll choose that time. They run, you know, unfortunately. But for those who know the issue, the real issue is to honor the Father in heaven, to bring glory to His name. That's the issue. And that's the issue that we want to follow. Those that are thrown into the lake, I'm going to just probably end it there because we, we, uh, we go into a controversial part of this. It talks about uh, the torment of fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And we want to address that. They have rest, no rest day or night. We want to address that because it, it really takes you into the lake of fire that the uh, folks will experience that don't honor the law of God. And so we want to clarify that and make sure people understand exactly what that's talking about. And so we'll end it right here for today. Next week, we'll finish up chapter 14. And... Instead of going into the seven last plagues, I'm going to pause. I'm going to kind of put, put the, hit the pause button on that because that's, again, we're, we've been dealing with this for so many months. I don't want people to get discouraged and frustrated, but I want to hit the pause button on that for a second and go into some, some Christian virtues that, in other words, what will prepare us to stand Though the entire world is arrayed against God's people, what, what will it be that will prepare God's people to stand? What, 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 those 144,000, you know, what are the virtues and the characteristics that, they, that they'll possess? We want to focus more on those for our, a couple of weeks before we actually finish up uh, going go into the, uh, the actual plagues, the seven last plagues. So that's what we've got coming up. But we'll finish up <clears throat> chapter 14 next week. Sound good? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, well, let me just invite you to pause for just a minute. And uh, our main man, Elijah, is uh, uh, not with us this morning. So, <clears throat> so I'll have closing prayer. So just pause for just a minute and bow your head with me. Father, we want to thank you. We want to praise you for our study today and the marvelous plan of salvation that, you, that you've implemented for us. And Lord, how important it is for us to understand that song that the 144,000 sing and uh, the, the offerings that you have made in, in order to secure uh, salvation for humanity. And Lord, we, we do pray that you'll use us in a mighty way to play the role that we need to play in bringing this last warning message to humanity. Guide and direct us. Fill us with your Spirit completely and utilize us in accomplishing that work. Bless each person that's heard this message. And we pray, Lord, that 
that uh, you will be our sure victory in our high tower, that we can run to you, never be afraid, but just do that which you've convicted us to do. And uh, we pray this, uh, this prayer in the name of Jesus. Also, we ask, Lord, that you bless our fellowship time, that you bless the food that you prepared. May it fit us up for glory, we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, well, thank you guys. And uh, I hope you didn't mind me getting just a little stirred up there. That's, that's this message really. This message actually, uh, this chapter was really the, the inspiration for the Ark Secret book. And so if you, if you don't have a copy of that, you'll want to get a copy of the Ark Secret book. And uh, we want to thank you guys for once again joining us as always. Thank you for your, your prayer support that keeps us going, your words of encouragement. Thank you for supporting us in other ways as well. And uh, we just pray that you will have a wonderful Sabbath and that you'll have a great week to come. We'll see you next time, same place, homechurch.us. Have a great week. And Susan commented that the commandments and the faith of Jesus will sustain us. Amen. You know, I, I listened to some of those uh, ministers on TV every now and then. Week before last, I was listening to John Hagee, his son, right. uh, uh, Matthew Hagee. Uh -huh. And he says, the reason we keep Sunday as our day of worship is because God was ra or Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday. Right. That was the reason. Yeah. And see, that goes back to, again, the human... He was raised in a human glorified body. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to, again, the emphasis on the human sacrifice. And, and not... That, again, they're totally oblivious to the divine sacrifice. I mean, listen... Uh, uh, the only reason that Christ was resurrected on Sunday was because he, he, because of that marriage that took place below Calvary with his his divine offering as well. That's the only reason he could be. If he hadn't made that divine offering, if that marriage hadn't taken place, there would have been no resurrection. What you know? And they don't understand that. 